Well, hello. <laughs> um, well, so I'm going to talk about yield and risk analysis. That's uh, what I did uh, in the X Trade system for Mercap. First, an overview. Uh, what we are going to talk first, review some financial terms because maybe the translation won't be uh, direct in, in some cases. And then talk about, well, basically what X Trade is and what. What uh, we've already talked about in small talk, at small talks, the uh, previous small talks, uh, then going to to the yield and the risk analysis. That's the development that we have made, and maybe look uh, for some code details. Not not looking at the implementation, but I'm going to mention some some interest, interesting stuff. And if there's enough time, we'll see a live example or some of the of the tools. So, well, uh, first, a review of some terms that maybe you know in Spanish but not in English. Uh, well, basically, bond. Uh, when I say bond, I mean the bonus, not the U2, uh, and <laughs> not it's not James Bond. Bond is a bono. Uh, stock, it's uh, acción. Certificate of deposit, it's what we call here el plazo fijo. An option contract, uh, here we say opción, contrato de opción, and same with future contract, uh, futuros. Interest rates are uh, tasa de interés, and when I say yield, uh, in this case, I mean rendimiento. Yeah. So, now that that's settled, uh, let's talk about X-Trade. It's a system that uh, is developed uh, at Mercap. It uses, well, obviously Smalltalk, that's why, why we are here, uh, particularly VA uh, Smalltalk, uh, and uh, we use Gemstone as the, well, instead of a database, all of the Customer information is stored uh, in Shamstone. So Xtrade has already produced some interesting modules that we've talked about previously, like the workflow system that's uh, underlying most of the. Um, sorry, Xtrade is uh, basically asset management up to now. Uh, so you have a portfolio, maybe you want to to manage it. So you you buy the system to to see how well you're doing, or maybe uh, register all of your what you buy, what you sell. Uh, see some results, some reporting tools. So the workflow system is underneath uh, all of the, the, the procedures of, of the system. We have also a report editor that uh, we showed last year. That's very complete and complex tool. An automatic integrator that was also a talk in the previous small talks uh, that helps with the development integration. And also a time and a measure model uh, which deal with units and time zooming in and out of time, but you probably already know about that. So now, uh, what we did was add, uh, apart from all of the asset management uh, tools, some yield analysis tools and risk analysis. And what we mean with this, uh, yield analysis is basically um, tools that uh, allow an investor to estimate the real value of the asset. Yes, if you have a, um, a portfolio of stocks, bonds, options, all of that, that I uh, showed previously, and you know uh, the price you bought it, and you know the market price today, yesterday, maybe you can know how it's going to be, I don't know, tomorrow, but not a month from now, and you, you're not sure maybe if there's a crisis coming or the market's going to go up, down. What's the real value of, of your asset? So yield analysis helps you with that. And also, then risk analysis allows to understand the risks uh, associated with investments. Investments, you, you may be considering to, to do, maybe what stocks to buy, what uh, bonds to sell from what you have, what's the, the worst that that um, a particular idea could could be if you execute it. In, I mean, if you spend your money on something new. 
So yield analysis is basically evaluation, as I said. Uh, bonds, stocks, options, and futures are the, the new valuations that we've developed. Um, for bonds, we have yield curve, spot curve, forward curve, sensitivity, sensitivity analysis, and some arbitrage opportunities that, uh, well, there are tools that are related to what we did. Uh, first, I want to tell you a little about uh, yield curve. Is basically uh, for all of these are well, I said for bonds. Uh, the yield curve is the, the an example there. Uh, the blue the blue line and the x axis is time. The y axis is yield rate. Yes, interest. And it basically tells you how much you you expect to win if you spend. Uh, how much the, the bond should pay in different time frames, and then, um, well, some you have to choose representative bonds, and the rest is inter interpolated. We developed some linear regression there to build the curve. Uh, the spot curve is built with the reference points from the spot from the yield curve, sorry, by a method called backtracking. That we, it's well known and it was added to to the system, uh, and it's very useful to to compare. A bond investment with I don't know, a certificate of deposit investment, for example. And a forward curve is built up, uh, with information from the spot curve, just as much as the spot curve is built with information from the yield curve. Um, and it uh, helps with understanding the expected rate, uh, investment rate that you should get if you spend, I don't know, in six months, you spend some money for two years, what's the expected return from that? And, well, uh, that helps. With the next part, that's sensitivity analysis. Um, this that you see here are all um, spot curves, yes, like the, the red one here. Well, here what we do is uh, um, build simulations of what would happen with the with these curves that uh, represent the um, bond valuation if some um, occurrences happen. If uh, I don't know the rates go up in general or uh, go down for some specific bond, so with these different curves, you know what the um, what's the expected valuation of your bond, and you know um, there's what uh, arbitrage means. Basically, if you have some bonds, and according to these curves, they should be valued higher, and and the market they are lower, maybe it's a good chance to buy them. Maybe if you have a bond that according to some scenario set up with this, um, is overpriced. Maybe um, you could sell it and, and make some money. And well, then moving to stocks, um, we have the what's called the capital asset uh, pricing model. That's to, to value stocks, um, relating a stock with, with uh, some reference market. As you see here, uh, this uses list uh, square feet to build um, a line, and we're interested in the slope of this uh, of this curve, um, the different points that um, the evolution of um, stock prices and its relation with the evolution of market prices. Yes, there's an, a market index that tells us um, how the market evolves. We compare it with how the the stock price evolves, and so we know uh, what's called the beta beta coefficient that that gives a, a ratio of how, what's the impact of a change in the market in a specific stock. So if you know the market's gonna go up, maybe you want to invest on a stock that has, I know, a beta uh, over one, which means uh, that it will go even, it, it will rise even more than the market. If you know that the market's going down, maybe you want something with a lower beta. There are even some stock with zero beta, which means they are independent, hard to get, but they exist. And also sometimes uh, negative beta, which means that if the market goes down, uh, you will actually have a, a better bond price, uh, stock price. Sorry. Then going to options, we have what's called Black-Scholes model and implied volatility. Black-Scholes is basically a um, theoretical method to estimate the the price of a, of, a, of an option contract, and it uses market information and uh, some structural information from the option as well. It's a very well-known method. Uh, it requires some um, zero finding in functions. So we, we had to implement, uh, we'd, we'd work with that. We had some, some libraries that gave the, the zero finding tools and then we, we used them. Uh, then 
Another interesting tool for option contracts is what's in called implied volatility, something that you, it, volatility is uh, somehow the, the expected um, evolution in prices, gives a measure of how much uh, it can change from uh, price from one day to the next one. And maybe if you don't have that information or you want to foresee how it's, how it's going to change, you can use some, some zero finding again and, and use the Black and Scholes um, formula to see what uh, is a parameter in the R formula. It's a, an unknown variable here. And we build a curve with uh, similar option contracts. That's what uh, generally called the volatility smile. In this case, as you can see, it's not a smile at all. Um, so that's arbitrage opportunity again. There, are people working with, with the system can can see an opportunity here. Uh, this might very well mean that they should sell something they already have, or know if they have some some money to spend, which option contract to choose. And the same thing in 3D. In case uh, you want to see evolution of this curve through time, yeah, you can see the a tendency maybe here. And we are working always with Excel. Um, this all then, then I'm gonna talk you some more talk some more about that. Um, but you can use the same uh, properties that all Excel plots give you in 3D. That's uh, rotation and perspective elevation. For futures, we, are, we also have some theoretical valuation model uh, that again uses market information to to see what's the the theoretical price for a future contract. Um, then, on the other hand, uh, going to risk analysis, we'll see three tools that we developed. It's a value at risk, portfolio selection, and performance attribution. Value at risk, as it says there, uh, it's the highest loss. Uh, that you can have with a certain confidence. You want to know what's the worst that could happen from today to tomorrow or from this month to the next one uh, as regards uh, your portfolio you already have. So this requires uh, different techniques for each instrument. So you have bonds and stocks and options and all of them require different analysis. And you get then a, a unified value. Yes, only, I don't know if it says that the worst that would happen with 95% confidence is that you're going to lose $2,000. So that's uh, the kind of input that you get from this technique. Uh, well, there are different models. As always, we have a trade-off between the, the time it takes to get the, the result and the precision uh, you're going to get. Anyway, as always, uh, we are talking risk here, and it's just an estimation. It's a model. It's a tool that uh, that you can use, but you, you should never act only upon this. So different models that were implemented are called historical value at risk, parametric, and Monte Carlo. Historical value at risk basically takes into consideration what happened what happened in the past uh, days. You can say, I don't know, um, 100 days of uh, backwards and see what's been the, the evolution of your portfolio, of its value, and you uh, kind of Say, well, what's going to happen if what happened yesterday to my portfolio and its evolution happens tomorrow? And you get the value. Then you have a histogram there, ordering them, um, and you want to see what's the worst that could happen. So you see there in the example, uh, it says uh, 10%. That's a 90% uh, confidence level that the worst that would happen is in that case that you could lose $6 million. That's... Um, um, now, uh, the thing here that you, you have to remember is that uh, this is a risk modeling tool. It says what's the worst that would happen. You have to use this information for insurance um, requirements. Maybe the, the, um, if you are uh, an institution that is monitored by some other I don't know, governmental institution or something, maybe you need to, to have that much, that much money, I don't know, in, in cash, for example, a bank or um, some foundation. Uh, and it's, it's also useful to know what's the worst that, that your current um, ideas on, on investing, what, what's the worst that, that could happen. Then, it's so always there that confidence level. That's why the, the higher confidence you, you ask uh, there, that's the, the higher loss that it will tell, obviously. Then, in general, once you, you don't care that much and you accept a five, um, half and half, 
uh, 50% uh, confidence level, you start getting positive values. That's the worst that would happen is that you could win, but that's not what this tool is about. It generally takes values from one to five percent, even using this 10 percent. That's a nine percent, a 90 percent confidence level. That's even too too risky. Then a parametric values risk is the most simple. It's a, well, it's not. Uh, it's simple in, in its uh, theory. It requires you to group your assets, your portfolio, divide it into what's called risk factors. Different risk factors are valued uh, here in a different way with a different technique. They require all of the, the formulas that, that I've talked about previously. You need uh, the, the yield and spot curves to know what to do with your bond risk factors and you need that beta coefficient to know what to do with your stock risk factors. But it's simple. It's once you have the, all the correlation of the values pre-computed, it's the, the quickest method. And obviously, it's uh, the least uh, precise, maybe, but it's uh, used because it gives a, a quick estimation of what the world that would happen. And then Monte Carlo value at risk is the, the most time consuming. It requires for some systems that have implemented this um, have large clusters of machines computing the values required here. Um, this is basically a combination. You group your all your assets into the risk factors that this technique uses, but you then simulate something like this. You use a normal distribution generally to to create not hundreds but thousands or, I don't know, maybe someone could use millions of simulations instead of saying what happened in the last 100 days and see what's could ha what's that could happen tomorrow. You just simulate one million possible things for tomorrow. You see what's the, and you order them again and you see what's uh, the, the worst or the one in the, in the percentile that, that you choose. Portfolio selection is another tool, it's quite different. Again, it's risk-related. It gives you an idea of how to spend your money yeah, with a controlled risk for some definition of risk. You have to decide how to, to measure it. And it only provides suggestions, of course, if you, you are choosing how to measure risk and it tells you what to do, but you should. There's always the, the disclaimer that if you follow blindly what the system says uh, without thinking about it, well, we are not really responsible for that. Um, but um, the risk here that, that we chose was this beta coefficient for the portfolio weight across all your stocks. So what you are doing is really stock portfolio selection up to now. And what we are using to, to create this proposal, this suggestion of a portfolio with a certain risk, is a genetic algorithm which has multiple objectives. It uh, tries to, as it says there, to minimize uh, commissions because if you have to sell or buy uh, something that's not what you already have, you may have to pay uh, a little bit for it, uh, an extra. Um, it also tries to reach your your objective um, weight beta coefficient for all your portfolio. If you know the market's going up, you may want to ask the system to to give you a proposal of how to spend your money in high valued beta stocks, or uh, the contrary, if that's the case. I have a. Little screenshot, I don't know. You can see that that's how it looks in the system. Uh, you have on your left the, the original portfolio. It says you have a 1.4 and something beta. And you ask the system to suggest a portfolio. You configure, uh, in this case, for a 1.25 beta uh, and minimizing the commissions. And it prop gives you some proposal of how you could change uh, your portfolio structure. It's, it says they are, for instance, to sell a part of uh, Tenaris stock, and uh, that's because Tenaris has a very high beta value, and you want to lower your portfolio beta value, and it says, well, okay, buy some Galicia or Petrobras, and that will uh, uh, make it happen. And the last risk analysis tool, it's uh, performance attribution, that's... Uh, a name, it sums up a, a lot of techniques. What we did initially, it's what some call the Brinson model. And it compares your portfolio performance, yes, how much you won in a month, in a, a day, your profitability in a given time period with uh, some reference portfolio. It could be your competitor if you have one and if you get that data. 
it's useful. If not, some reference market index, for instance, and that's what's called the benchmark. And um, in this case, it, sell, it uh, tells you if there's a difference in performance, if you want more or less than the, the benchmark, it tells you, uh, gives you an idea um, of why. Uh, it's because I spent it on uh, different assets. Maybe I spent all of my money on option and future contracts and my competitor uh, invested in stocks. And maybe if that's the reason, this, this tells you in a, that, that the certain percentage of the difference in performance is due to what's called a um, selection and then um, you have interaction. There are different factors that, that it tells you. Or maybe if you spend on stocks and your uh, benchmark also in, uh, has stocks investment, but they are different. And so maybe that's uh, that because you, you, didn't choose, uh, you didn't choose the sorry, the right uh, stocks. What we have to hear is that you see how we configure in the system a benchmark and then have some nice graphics that Excel provides when we run a, a, the reporting tool and, and ask to, to show the, the difference. And, and you see there that you have the different effects, allocation, selection, and interaction. That's uh, what this Brinson model uh, separates the the portfolio and the, the performance. So something about uh, the code and, and the techniques. We we are using heavily a, an Excel connection, yes, with the, all the client widgets that VA Smalltalk provides uh, with uh, an Excel chart in linked mode. And uh, all of the Excel files are generated with X-Trade by using what's called the Excel wrapping model that was developed uh, by Mercap extending some, some other tools that were already there. And we made it compatible with all new versions of Excel as well because they have some nicer graphs and so that's uh, nicer also to, to the user interface and to the, to the potential customers. All of the formulas that I mentioned, all the techniques are composed formulas of using sub-formulas. That's, uh, and thanks to, to all the measurement model that x trade has, we can uh, never, we never forget about the, the units and we are always sure that there are enough assertions checking that the, the formulas are right and the structure is right and we don't mix um, different uh, currencies, for instance, without a specifying an, an exchange rate between them. And so we, we are always, um, Thankful to that because that's an, like an extra um, helping hand in, in writing the code. And also, um, as you have seen, uh, we have some histograms and zero finding functions. Um, well, um, a lot of probability is involved, especially a normal distribution and, and some others. And so we we also took a, um, we made use of what Dieter Besse did uh, in his book Object Oriented Implementation of Selected Numerical Method. That uh, for Java and Smalltalk, um, so all the, of the, that Smalltalk code. It's not the maybe the, the most elegant Smalltalk code, but it's really fast and it's efficient, and it allowed us to focus on the important financial formulas instead of starting from scratch, developing a zero finding function or a, or a, you know, a, a covariance calculator and, and that. So I have some time. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, uh, but I have to leave some time for questions. So maybe I'll just show it. Okay. Well, so we'll do some review. See. Uh, I'll show you some some. Of, this is extrade. Uh, I hope the projection is good. Uh, the tools that that are there are well. You see. Uh, for instance, we can ask for the um, spot curve for different dates or for the yield curve, whatever we need. The notebook is quite old-fashioned, so it may be slow. So I ask for this zero coupon that's the spot curve uh, for a given date. And what we can see here um, you can ask for the curve on different dates and maybe see an evolution. See, yes, that's uh, 
for instance, for Argentinian bonds uh, that are issued in dollars. And once the, the system has enough, enough information, it plots yes, the, the curves and it helps understand the, a little bit about how the, the bonds are evolving, for instance. Let's see. Anything else? Uh, well, here, so, so we can define this, all the, the benchmarks. And I have here a sample of how it, the, the whole report looks like. This performance attribution report. Uh, well, it does not show. See, so we have all this comparison be between a demo fund, uh, demo fund, and, and the benchmark. Some something else which I'm not telling you um, about the this Excel Excel widget that we did. Um, you are running ex you you require Excel for instance 2007 to to be able to plot the graphs, but then you get for free, let's say, that the the file is created, saved to disk, and here we show what uh, the, the the resulting graph. But since there is an Excel file there, we can also open, ask uh, it to be opened, because some of our customers maybe want to see. The, the information in Excel, so you always have the let's see. resolution is not helping. Um, on the second sheet of the file, you always have the the data that uh, created the graphic. That's useful because uh, in case you want to do some additional work with them, you can you can do that. And um, also, what that allows us is never to to publish the, the exact implementation or the formula. We are not just writing a formula in some Excel file and then making it to, to, to plot it. We made all the calculations in Smalltalk with x trade with all this um, measurement model, and then once it is ready, we write it to Excel and let it just do the, the plotting. All of the the the, um, the graphs that you see uh, use the same technique. Now we have again another. What I told you about you see here again that. Uh, so you see, it, it really exists, and it's not just a screenshot. Um, you have the chance to see your portfolio, and also you can check how the, um, the individual beta of each stock is built, yes, because the, the slope of this curve is what's um, helping. The calculation is done in, in small talk, obviously, but you can see the, a graphical representation of the, the stock. Awesome. Well, let's stop here for questions because the resolution ain't helping enough for the rest. Okay. Um, oh, I have the okay. Yeah. yeah, you said that uh, there was an algorithm that was uh, very time consuming or that some people that wanted to cover things. Yes. Yes. Are you using some Gemstone facility to do that, or no? Because with Gemstone we do. Yeah, we we are not uh, yet in production with the Monte Carlo um, algorithm, so there's been no need. I mean, with just a simple Gemstone that we we normally use. That's one Gemstone, one Gem, one Stone, everything. Well, do do it? Uh, Does it make sense to do it or not? Um, I don't know if the computations would require that. We, we are uh, pre-calculating, like at the beginning of each day, or however we want to configure it, all of the correlations between the, the data. So I don't think that that would be necessary, not, at least up, not up to what I've seen now. Any other question? Yep. 
But here for this kind of program code. Yes, yes, that, yes, it's useful. Many times I've had a, I don't know if I, uh, there is a case where, where units or currencies could uh, mix and I didn't take it into consideration and then I, uh, most of this is developed uh, except the, the Windows, it's everything with test driven development and I have a test and, and maybe it says the unit of a measurement bug is not defined and that's a kind of of a problem that, that it helps me. So, I Yes. I mean, thanks. The there was a big discussion the other day in the small companies here in Argentina, and some people say, well, but uh, you know, you have to change what you're doing sometimes. It's not good. So, I want to be confused. Well, in my experience, uh, in this case, at least when, when I'm basically taking information from, I know, classes or, I mean, classes, uh, lectures that, that I get at, at, uh, when I go to university or some of my, of my um, workmates, uh, what we, we do is basically take all what, of what we learn from lectures or textbooks and we model that as a test. I mean, if the textbook has some typical test uh, some, some typical examples. Well, uh, the same typical examples. We know that we work here because that's how we start with the with the development. And then the, the only difference or change that could come is uh, if after I have all the model developed with test-driven development, and when I prepare the window model, yes, uh, and I'm configuring the parameters, uh, maybe what I could see is that some parameter was missing. I, it was fixed in the test, and it should be a parameter in the model. Well, I just add that, and the test is easy to fix. Okay. How, how do you get that examples? Because they are uh, very complex in financials. Do uh, you, you have do you have a classes, or do you have a financial expert? Or yes, we. We, we use the, well, Markup has its own financial experts. We also hire uh, extra experts when, when the, the tools required it. When in, in the cases we, we didn't have anyone knowing exactly how a, um, a financial idea was, was to be faced or implemented, we, we took some help from, from outside. Uh, but also then, well, we, we read the books, the financial books. We, we are kind of trained in that and, and already used to, to working with textbooks and learning from them and, and basically transferring textbook knowledge to tests. And then the tests make sure that we have a, a decent model, at least. <laughs> no more questions? One more question. The system now has... Well over 20,000 for sure. Uh, yeah, I don't think we've reached 30,000 yet, but we'll do it. Uh, I mean, everything is done with test driven development, and the system is quite complex. So all of the models have at least as many t tests as it takes to to make sure that you have the, the basic functionality going. And most of the time, uh, if there's a, a bug, uh, the way to fix it is to, well, once you, you can reproduce it, you write a test that, uh, that does the same. So the test generally fails, and you correct the code, and you run all the tests again, and now the, all of the previous tests and the new one should pass. That's how we work. Mm -hmm.